Hi everybody, my name is Don Dixon and I'm welcoming you back to our continuation of our master class study on fishing all of the different types of structure. And uh, we made it through bars and now we're in the middle of a study of humps. We established already that there are three basic types of humps and then we're added to that saddles and delta conditions which are hump-like structure situations that aren't pure in the sense that they don't have deep water on all four sides. In the case of uh, the delta condition only has deep water on one side and in the case of a saddle it has deep water on two sides the upstream side and the downstream side. It's a natural lake it's the high spot in between two deep bodies of water two deep water holes that's referred to as a saddle. Today we're going to talk a little bit about how to fish these five different types of humps. It's really pretty simple. I'm going to be talking more in detail in our presentation of lures as we get into that study, but for today's study, I'm going to talk just in general terms that when I'm fishing the first type of a pure hump, the shallow water hump, that's normally should go without saying. We're pretty much going to be able to uh, cast that and cast it very thoroughly and check it all on the cast only and As you move deeper we know in order for that particular hump to, to uh, Produce it has to be Connected to a larger structure that does lead all the way from the shallows to the deep so as we Check that shallow water hump. It's not going to be anything. We need to spend any time on it's pretty simple to do uh, and then secondarily we're going to move from there to that mid lake hump and that's where we said that it leads, actually leads, it's out in the middle of the lake but it leads from the shallows to the deep and let's say we establish that it's going to produce because it has some good deep final breaks. We're going to start by fan casting the top of that structure and I would be sitting on the off side, I think I mentioned that the last time we talked, and throwing towards the business side because we know the, the fish won't go downhill to get shallower. So they're not sitting on the back side of that hump. So that's where I'm going to park my boat as I fan cast the top of the hump. And if it's really a huge hump, I may have to get on my trolling motor and, and move around the grass line and, and, and uh, fish it in that fashion. But casting the top of the hump, the crown of the hump, that's where I start my business uh, once I locate that structure. And the reason is pretty simple. It's how I fish all structures. I don't want to be sitting out there in 45 feet of water with a real slow jump bait trying to coax some fish to hit my lure when the entire school of fish is sitting up on top of that saddle, active as heck, ready to take the bait. So we interpret, most of the time we, inter we interpret our structure from deep to shallow. But we fish our structures from shallow to deep. So once I've checked the entire crown of that structure, my next step is to simply start to begin fishing the breaks and the brake lines, the deeper breaks and brake lines that are on or connected to that hump, and always on the side that's adjacent to the deep water sanctuary zone. Uh, and depending on the size of that structure, if it's a small structure, maybe sometimes I can do it just simply by casting. But in most structures, it'll involve trolling and casting both. Uh, but the idea of how do you fish it, pretty much like you fish anything else. Uh, you're fishing the deeper breaks and brake lines, both trolling and casting. And then we have the deep water humps. We talked about uh, humps that may be crowned at 25 or 30 or 35 feet, the shallowest part. And it leads right into 50 or 60 or 70 feet of water. And these humps can be extremely productive for you and me. It's one of my favorite situations to run into. And it's not just that deep water hump. We can also, as we start talking about how we're going to fish it, we can also include saddles. Because the saddle normally is somewhere at the top of it or the crown of it is normally in that same general 25, 30, 35 feet sitting in between, you know, these two deep holes or in the river system, uh, the deep water upstream, deep water downstream. So we fish these two features the same way. And I start by fishing the crown of that saddle or the crown of that deep hump. 
Now we're going to keep in mind now that we've already established through our mapping that this, these are productive saddles and productive humps. Otherwise, we wouldn't be fishing it, right? Okay. So I start by fishing the crown. I want to make sure to cover the entire top of that deep hump or deep saddle. Now, in some cases, many of you uh, have seen my tape, I think, on the saddle that we fished up at my summer school. It's quite long, quite uh, a distance between the upstream deep water and the downstream. I think if I had to guess just looking out here on my home lake, it'd probably be about 300 yards. 200 yards of that, or at least 150 yards, is the crown of that saddle. So because that's such a distance, completely fishing all over the top of it wouldn't be necessary. They're not going to find any fish it, it, in too flat. I'd rather be fishing the brake lines in the brakes on the upstream side and then on the downstream side and be in being really careful to notice where we have turns in those brake lines and, and, and creating little mini bars and so on and so forth. These little brakes on the brake lines. This is where I'm going to find my fish. But in most deep water saddles or deep water humps, we have to fish the entire top crown of the bar unless it's so big like I just suggested to you. Most of the time we're going to check all of the top. We got to make sure the fish aren't there because if they're there, they're active. If they weren't active, they wouldn't be there. So we got to fish the shallowest portion first. And then how do we fish the deeper sections? Well, we fish the breaks and break lines that lead until we hit that drop off into the deep water sanctuary zone. And in most cases, it's going to involve trolling and casting both. Now again, the details of exactly how we're going to fish. We're going to talk about that in, in our presentation series, which comes up later. But you're getting the idea, I think. And in order to let you know how important finding, identifying, mapping, and fishing a deep water hump can be, I'm going to give you an example. I think I mentioned it the other day. I was doing a a promotion up in New York. It involved when we were up in that Finger Lake area and this guy who was the the uh, wholesaler for all of the tackle stores clean across all western New York. He had everything locked up. I mean Rochester, uh, Buffalo, uh, over into Syracuse and, and, and that entire Finger Lake area every tackle store dealt with this guy. So we were doing this promotion for them and we, we couldn't find what we thought was the best lake. Uh, and we fished every one of the Finger Lakes. We started over in the Western Basin and came this direction. Or I mean the Eastern Basin came west. And every lake we found, some of them were 800 feet deep. World War II they tested some submarines in this one lake. And these extremely deep, clear Finger Lakes were so cold. We were there in August and the water was ice cold. Now most of you have been around me know that fish are cold blooded creatures and the colder the environment the more dormant they are and the harder they are to catch. It's that simple. So we didn't like all that cold water and people were laughing at us up there. They said nobody even goes swimming up here in the summertime. That water's so cold. Okay. Well it's not so good for our fishing either. So we kept looking and tried to find a different lake that might be more to our liking. And we fished five or six of those lakes. We, we didn't like any one of them. We caught some fish, but it wasn't the kind of thing that'll shake up a, a city. So we are still looking for a better lake. And all of a sudden we came on this lake called Canisius Lake, just south of Rochester, I think about 22 miles. And my partner and I were eating a sandwich. We crawled out of the van and went down to the dock and. We reached down and washed our hands off, and that water was warm like bath water. Oh, yeah, that's what we're looking for. Warm water, uh, more active fish, easier to catch. That simple. So we hurried up, launched both of our boats. We had both of our, our boats with us. We launched both boats. He went one direction, I went the other. And when we got out on the lake, we didn't have a contour map, but when we got out on the lake, we found that there was about a 10-foot weed line. So as our normal procedure, we started following that 10-foot weed line. Running up there, and of course, following the weed line, 
you know, we got a lure out, you're going to possibly catch a fish and direct your attention to a certain area. But in most cases, you're following that weed line looking for something to change, something to be different. Sure enough, I went about a quarter mile or so, and all of a sudden, that old weed line turned right out, in the middle of the lake, turned around, come back. It created what we talked about last week, a three-sided bar. Beautiful, beautiful, big, long, but narrow and ridge-like. It, it looked good. And when my lure, when I went out and made one loop across the front of that bar, bang, I popped a fish. And it was a good fish. It was a school fish. It was a northern pike, about 12 pounds. Uh, not a great fish, but a good fish, an adult fish. So I already confirmed I had fish. I had structure. So my normal course of doing business, now that we found it, we probably have a pretty good lake here. I'm going to do some mapping of this bar, put that away, and do some drawings, draw the bar out, all the depths involved, because we're going to do some fishing here. So I put my rod down, no more fishing, and went to my mapping, following the brake lines, getting the size and shape of the bar, which I did, and as my normal procedure, I take soundings off of any unusual feature. There were a couple little fingers on the bar, not so much. It looked to me like the end of the bar was the contact point. But I still had a couple other little features. I just went off this feature, took my soundings, led to deep water, went off this other one, led to deep water. I think, led, as I recall, it led to about 50 feet of water. It may have been 45 feet, 50 feet, somewhere in there. But it led. And I already confirmed it's good. I already caught a fish. But then as I turned and went off the end of the bar, where I assumed already, sort of thought, that that's the contact point, the longest, narrowest, I went off the end of that bar, and it broke good. It broke like at 17 feet, and then sloped off to about 22 or 24 feet. Can't remember exactly. It happened a long time ago. 24 feet, broke again into about 35 feet of water. And then it started sloping, and gradually got into about 45 feet of water. And so I kept following it, hoping that it would break again from 45 to 70 or something like that, but it didn't. I went just a little bit further and all of a sudden, instead of seeing it breaking deeper, all of a sudden it started getting shallower. Come out of that 45 is 40 and then bang up to 35 feet. And then at the top, 32 feet, 32 feet, as I'll give you a side view here. I'm 32 feet and all of a sudden it starts flattening out 32 feet, then goes down the lake side, goes down 35 feet, 37 feet, 42 feet and breaks off into 60 feet of water. Ooh! <laughs> I've got me something good. I already know the bar produces. Now, if this hump in some way is connected to that bar, and it seems like it's in relative, close enough relatively uh, to, to connect, I've got to find that out because if the hump will produce, and it is connected and a hump will produce, I might be catching fish there all the rest of the summer and I never get them up the school of fish up to the end of the bar. So I got to find out, does that hump connect? Now, I started doing my normal map and interpretation of the hump at this point. Again, I'm not going to go into detail on that. We're going to talk about that later, much later in our mapping class. But as I started off of that deepest break line, as I recall, is around 42 feet into 60, something like that. I got on that drop off and started following it. And as I went around the hump, I saw that it was quite big. The hump was big. And it was sort of shaped oblong. It was kind of strange. But as I followed around that corner out there and it started coming back in, and it kept getting closer and closer and closer and closer to the end of that bar. And when it got pretty almost smack dab up, it was getting a little bit shallower, 42, 40, and then 37 ish. And it just came up and basically tied right into that bar. So now I know. I've got a beautiful structure situation. I've got a bar that looks great. And it's connected to a deep hump that crowns at 32 feet and breaks at 42. I think in one spot it broke at 45. Into 65 or 70 feet of water, extra deep water. And that ended up being deepest water in the lake. What a structure. And I found it by simply taking soundings like I normally would do off of a bar. Now I can tell you, 
I think I mentioned earlier in our last talk. I can't tell you how many, it's been hundreds of times, while taking soundings off a shoreline bar, three-sided bar, I've run smack dab up on a hump, a deep water hump, which connected in some way, normally it's, it connects through deeper brake lines, it'll connect in with that bar, it all becomes one, one structure. And many times the fish will get active, they'll move up, they'll, they'll hit the, that hump, and they'll move to the crown of the hump, and you're catching fish down there on the top of that hump, but they never get all the way up to the bar. Now under certain weather and water conditions, they're going to make it up to that bar. And since I know that, I'm going to always be checking that bar. To check the shallows and all the brake lines just like I normally would. But in the end, I'm expecting to catch a bunch of fish off of that hump. Almost under any and all water conditions, I expect to catch fish off that hump. If I do a good job of fishing, and I'm going to fish that hump, just like a fish a saddle or any other deep structure. That's how I'm going to fish it all the same. But finding those deep humps and then establishing that they will produce and that they are connected. Remember, for a deep hump to produce, it has to be connected to 99% of the time it's a bar. It has to be connected to another structure that leads all the way because the hump itself doesn't lead all the way. Out by itself, that hump is no good. But connected to a shoreline feature, it leads from the leads from that deepest water all the way to the woods. It leads all the way to the bank. And for a structure to produce, especially that deep hump to produce, it must lead all the way. And in the case of this hump up in uh, <laughs> Canisius Lake, it led all the way. Now let me tell you what happened. I went and got Tommy, and we put a hurting on that hump. We worked at thing for two three days we got uh, the, the the writer and the tackle dealer that, from Rochester we took them fishing down there we caught four or five walleyes in the eight pound class off that hump the outdoor writer told me he didn't realize and he didn't think anybody else realized that there was walleye in Canisius Lake there was largemouth there was smallmouth there was northern pike there were thousands of northern pike I mean you, you just catch them all day long but nobody said anything about walleye. We're catching big walleye off our deep hump. And once we got our write-ups and once it got known at the local tackle shop, and it was a big tackle shop downtown Rochester, we were doing our clinic. And when we did our clinic, all of a sudden, what's normally 100, 150 guys showing up? This was way back in the early days. We had like 350 or 400 people showed up at this clinic a one night clinic on how to catch fish and of course the trigger for all that was all these fish that we were catching and and they were shooting pictures of in this local lake and to make it even better the lake has a house every three feet I mean it was a party lake it was a water skiing lake it was swimming it was everything but fishing it was forgotten when it came to fishing until we showed up and man, we turned that town upside down. We turned Western New York upside down on one lake. And as we fished it, it wasn't just the, that deep hump, but that was the best structure in the lake, which I found just by going through my procedures. Now, here's the funniest part of that whole story. Of the people that were at that clinic that night, two gentlemen walked up to me and they said they had never heard anything like that. They'd never seen anything like the pictures. They hadn't fished it. But they saw the newspaper article, and they've heard the rumblings around town. Rochester's not that big a town. And he said, when I came to the clinic, I didn't know what to expect. He said, but that was the most fascinating stuff I've ever heard. He said, and I want to let you give you my card and let you know that I, I work for Kodak, now the camera people. And he said, Kodak is huge here in Rochester. It's our headquarters. And I think at the time they were employing like 60,000 people or something. I mean, they owned the town, period. And he said, but we have a fishing club. It has about 400 people in it. He said, I'd like to hire you to come up to Kodak in Rochester and give the, a clinic like that to our folks up there in our fishing club. And I said, well, you know, I'm like Paladin. You know, have money, we'll travel. You know, So I set a deal. I said, I'll, I'll come. I'll give you the dates where I could do it, and then you let me know 
uh, if you're interested. And he said, well, be sure to include what you would charge. He said, we want to make it. You're coming all the way from Pennsylvania up here to do this. He said, uh, we won't pay you. We won't pay you right. So I started thinking when I left, uh, you know, it's a corporation. So I could ask him for probably a lot of money and then they'll probably cut me way down and, and I can get some nice money to do this clinic. So I sent him a proposal. I said, I'd make the travel up there and do the job and, and take even take a day's fishing with some of the big shots at Kodak for $2,500. Now at the time, my partner and I basically were starving to death. We, were, we never had any money. We weren't making any money. And I thought that was a bold deal, but I thought maybe they might cut it down and pay us a thousand bucks. So I sent him this, this proposal. He, he answered me immediately. He said, you're on, sounds good. Didn't even try to cut me down. He offered me $2,500 to come and give a one night to our clinic. I was so thrilled, I called Buck and I said, Buck, you're not gonna believe this. I think things are beginning to break for us. <laughs> I said, I'm getting paid an unbelievable amount of money to go do a show at Kodak. And I gave him the details and he said, you know what? I needed to see this wholesaler up there. I'm going to fly up uh, and meet him in Buffalo and come over to Rochester the night of your clinic. He said, and he hadn't seen me do a clinic ever. We talked about it at the shop. We talked about it while he in a boat, but he's never been to one of my clinics that I was doing on my own. So I said, that'd be great. And then I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. Somebody's paying me $2,500, way more money than I'm worth. And Buck Perry's gonna be sitting in the first row. Uh oh, I started getting a little nervous. But at the same time, we go up, we do the show, and, and they took us out to a great dinner, top of the top of the tower, one of those restaurants that moves around while you're eating, you know, you're looking out over the whole city. It was beautiful. All of the big wigs from Kodak. And we were just a couple of river rats, you know. It, it was really an impressive time for us. We were thrilled and Buck was sitting there and I felt good for Buck too. And getting some real respect like he deserves. And we go to do the show. And as we're parking the car, there's people running around all over the place. I said, how many people are here? I said, how many people do you think are coming? He said, well, I'm hoping to get three or 400. He said, but all these people you see, he said, we have a big complex here. We got three, uh, swimming pools that are Olympic size. We have five bowling alleys. They have all, I mean, they had a complex that had everything. Anyway, that's what I get for sitting out on the dock. I still hear them. At any rate, we're going to get back to this story. So we're eating this beautiful dinner, and I mean, it was one of those restaurants where, you know, Everybody was having something that was lit up and, and you know, prime rib, all, all the best stuff. And all these fired up desserts. It was fancy. I was thrilled. And I was thrilled that Buck was there. So we go over to do the show and we see all these people. And he tells me about the bowling alleys and the swimming, uh, you know, Olympic swimming pools they have there. And he said, this it's like this every night. Should people bring their kids? He, you know, he said, we employ 60,000 people. I said, well, how many, how many you think come a thing? He said, well, this is the fishing club put this on us. It'd be probably 300. We're hoping for 300. I said, well, that'll be good. And I didn't think much else about it. We go in and I go behind uh, the curtain and I look at the facility and uh, they had a 40 foot screen set up for me. And Tommy was running my slides on this from about 100 feet away on a 40 foot screen. I mean, this was a big deal. And now I got all of this going on and Buck Perry in the first row. So I'm a little bit nervous. At any rate, about quarter to seven, we we're starting at seven, quarter to seven, I peek out and it looked like there's only about hundred people there. And I thought, oh man, I don't want Buck to be disappointed. This, this is, I hope people, some more people show up. And then I sort of forgot about it. And Tommy come running in about two minutes to seven, three minutes to seven, because he was in the back uh, near the projection booth, and he said, you need to come see something real quick. So I ran out with him, and we go to the front where the doors open up, and there's one of those signs that sits like this, big sign. 
and it showed this, you know, structure fishing clinic and all of that, and then it had a big old sign across the top of it. It says, sold out. Sold out? What does that mean? He said, open the door and take a look. That place had filled up. And they had an auditorium where the uh, symphony, the Rochester Symphony, plays their, their concerts. It seats 2,500 people. There were 2,500 people. In 20 minutes, 2,500 people showed up in that auditorium. And when I went around and looked out, <laughs> peeked out the curtain, sure enough, it was packed. Every seat was taken. They told me later on it was the only second time that it had ever sold out in the history of the, uh, the complex. So now I have 2,500 people looking at me, waiting to hear something good. And I got Buck Perry sitting in the first row, the guy who wrote the book, the genius. Got a 40-foot screen. <laughs> for what I used to do on a little, you know, some walls we used to do it on. Now I got a 40 foot screen and 2,500 people. Man, it was something. It was good. It was so much fun. I can look back and think back on it and think this is the best thing I ever did. And then we found out afterwards when we went out for coffee and dessert and stuff, there goes another one of those big boats. We went out for coffee and dessert, and we found out that they had sold tickets to this little clinic for five dollars a piece. So we found out. <laughs> I was so thrilled to get twenty-five hundred. They took in twelve thousand five hundred dollars and gave us twenty-five hundred. They made ten grand on the deal. <laughs> so. I always look back at that with a smile on my face and laugh about it because not only am I not worth 10 grand, I'm not worth 2,500 either for a one night deal. But that's what we got paid that night. And the whole point of the story was, it all came from a deep hump. A deep hump that I'm not sure anybody that fished that lake even knew about. I never, we never saw any fishermen out there. We had it to ourselves. There was smallmouth on it. There was a bunch of pike on it. There was a bunch of big walleyes. There was a school of big walleyes that no one had ever touched. They were basically hitting that hump every day. We absolutely killed the fish. So the, those humps, those deep water humps, they'll save you because if they're connected and you you know that it's producing, on the bad weather conditions, when the fish aren't moving up to the end of that bar, they're not moving up to 17 feet or to 14 feet but they get active down in the sanctuary zone. They become active at 32 feet, and if you have a target to hit at 32 feet, you can catch a string of fish, people won't believe it, that you caught them that day. Bad weather. You can always catch a few. So that's pretty much how you fish the deep water humps. When we come back on our next talk, we're gonna talk about uh, how, uh, how to really fish the uh, mid-lake hump and I'm going to give you a little of mapping and interpretation along with it while I tell you a story uh, that happened on what we refer to as Star Hump. Give you a little map and interpretation. We'll tell you uh, what the details and the end result of was a fish in that particular spot. It's pretty interesting and it makes the point. So until the next time we meet, like us on Facebook and be sure to tell your friends and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for being with me today. See you the next time.